Hey everyone, today we're going to talk about social movements. And if I could, this would be a topic that I would spend, I don't know, a whole semester on. Um, as it gets into the idea of activism, it gets into the idea of how storytelling uh, changed the world, and really about us getting to a place where we're more equal and people are treated the way that they should be treated. And so that's what we're going to talk today about social movements. Now, again, kind of our backdrop, our context is this idea of the enlightenment going on and famous writers talking basically about natural rights and what people are born with and the ability of life and liberty, the ability to own property, um, the idea that people should be represented, kind of the pushback against absolute rule. Um, and with that came these new social movements where people wanted to expand who that was allowed for. Um, and typically, no offense, but this is what the reality is, is at this time, the Enlightenment really was mostly for white people. And not just white people, land-owning white people who were male. And there were a lot of people that got left out of that. Um, people who um, were people of color and women. And so today's social movements that we're going to talk about is how this shifted and included kind of this movement and slavery, this movement for equal rights, uh, this movement that women also could vote and go to school. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about. So here we go. Giddy up. Let's get into kind of what's going on here um, in this story for social movements. And so again, just a little bit of our context as we are looking at this and as I can kind of get to the next slide here, um, we are going to be looking and reminding ourselves about the Atlantic slave trade. Um, this is a horrible institution. It's a horrible time in history. Um, and in your brain, if you can kind of think 1500s to 1800s, that there are over 12 million people who were forcibly migrated, people who were kidnapped, people who were sold into slavery, children that were taken from their parents. These are people who before this had jobs, had careers, had roles, were doctors and moms um, and dads, people who worked in politics from these great kingdoms, right? And we kind of talked about this before and they then were forcibly migrated someplace else. Now, this was a result, again, more context here, because of the Colombian exchange and the labor shortages that came from people who were Native Americans dying. And again, Europeans forcing people to work for them. And so here is kind of like, this is the reality and the backdrop of how we begin to push against this system. And so we know that most people were forcibly migrated from Central and Western Africa. Um, and we know that approximately 98% went to Brazil or the Caribbean um, in Central Mexico as well, with very few, like 2% or so coming to North America. But we just know how big of a part of our own American story that is. And so let's kind of look at that and what happens. Now, the first people that were part of this activism, this people who push back against the system for more equality are the Quakers. Now the Quakers are a British kind of group that were a religious group who basically said um, because of their Christian beliefs that slavery went against um, who they believe people are and who God created people to be. And so this is kind of part of another movement in the United States or at the time the British colonies, uh, which is known as the Great Awakening. But either way, in 1688, the Quakers were the people that were pushing for this equality. I remember because they were colonies at this time. Let's kind of go over and see what was happening in Britain, because Britain is really going to be uh, the people that lead this charge initially for abolitionism. So jumping across the ocean. Uh, some really cool stories here. Let me just kind of start with the James Somerset legal case in 1772. Basically what happened is, again, from the colonies, the American colonies, um, an African slave was purchased in Boston. Um, and then his owner brought him to England and he escaped. James Somerset escaped, ran away while he was in England. Now he was recaptured. But basically, people took it to court to say, hey, here in England, we don't recognize slavery. Um, we know that colonial laws permit slavery, 
but it's not a thing here in England. It's not part of our common law. And so should it be recognized because James Somerset was a slave from the colonies? And so they took it to court and they ruled that slavery was not part of British common law. And so he was set free because of this. And this kind of set this legal precedent, this kind of initial part. I love these next stories. Now, another part of this, and you guys, we looked at some of this already in our class here uh, in Appleton, Wisconsin, um, is this, is basically looking at the autobiography and the stories that came from a lot of Equiano and his slave narratives and about the terror and about how terrible slavery was as he exchanged um, kind of owners throughout his own life story. And for those of you that listen to it, and if you haven't, I really highly recommend this, just to hear a firsthand account of what that story was like. And so his autobiography that was published um, after he was freed really spurred this abolition movement in England. Now, lots of other cool stories here. Another really cool story, and we maybe have talked about this before, um, but John Newton. John Newton actually used to um, be a part of like the Navy in England and kind of within his lifetime also was a slave ship driver. So he was kind of the captain of the boat. And we've read um, kind of the narrative of what it was like aboard a slave ship when kind of this abolitionist movement um, happened and they ended and they kind of came across the ships. Um, and John Newton is a guy who was that guy. He was the slave ship driver. And kind of in his own life story, kind of had this conversion experience. He converted to Christianity. Um, and maybe you're not familiar with this, but he actually penned the song Amazing Grace, often played at funerals. Uh, but this song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me, that was talking, if we look at the context of the lyrics, was talking about himself as a former slave ship driver. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Like it, the context of those lyrics to know that he once did these um, unthinkable things, but then turned his life in a way that he once was a part of this and now fought against it as an abolitionist is really powerful. And people using their words as activists. Now, kind of... Uh, next part of the story, because John Newton uh, had his life changed, he was actually friends with another guy named William Wilberforce. And this is kind of all in the, the story of the abolitionist movement in England. And William Wilberforce was elected to Parliament, and he was also advocating to end the slave trade. Okay, And the crazy thing about William is that he actually wanted to leave working in politics so that he could become a pastor. And his friend John Newton said, no, 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 I think that you should remain in the parliament because we believe that you can do amazing things to end the slave trade as a person in parliament more than you could as a pastor. And so he stayed. And because he stayed, he authored this bill in 1807 that abolished the slave trade in all of the British realm, which is huge and hugely impacting. Um, and nothing against a pastor who would maybe pastor their own church. But for him, like this was life changing in so many people's lives. And this is kind of where it starts. Now, uh, they eventually will pass also their the Slavery Abolition Act in 1833, which means that they actually abolish slavery in the British Empire. So the first was just ending the trade, right? So it didn't end the institution of slavery, it just ended the trade of it. Um, as we kind of go on, France, kind of to their south here, uh, has their own revolution that we're going to learn about. And revolutionary France, kind of inspired by the Enlightenment, will abolish slavery actually kind of earlier in 1794. But then they kind of flip flop and restore slavery. So Enlightenment deals, yay! And then they restore this old ancient regime, if you will. Now, what's going to happen then in France is... In 1818, they're going to end the slave trade. And by the 1840s, they actually end slavery within the colonial realm of the French Empire. Now, um, as we kind of go to the United States, whew, it's a lot to this story. 
Um, but we know about the American Revolution, and we know that at one point, Thomas Jefferson helps to pen the Declaration of Independence, right? Um, I really want to highly recommend this book. Uh, if you have not read, there we go, Stamped. Um, it is by uh, Jason Reynolds and Ibram Kendi, and I highly, highly recommend it. Um, but in there, it talks about how Thomas Jefferson is kind of this walking contradiction, right? In this book, he was involved in the Continental Congress. He penned the Declaration, um, and he phrased basically that phrase, all men are created equal. All men are created equal. Yet, um, but we're slaves men. What about women? Like all these things that we like read now and people kind of like appeal back to this ideal. But even at this time, um, Thomas Jefferson, um, he grew up on a slave plantation. He owned slaves himself. And so when we start looking at this story, he's kind of Thomas Jefferson as a person is really tricky to kind of understand um, what he thought. He thought, and this kind of like outlines some of his works and things that he wrote, he wrote notes on the state of Virginia, that uh, people who were black, they could never assimilate because they were inferior by nature. Come on, TJ. Um, he said other things that they felt love, but not pain. They aren't reflective, operate only on instincts that slaves would result in a, like if we would end slavery, it would result in a race war. And you're like, oh no, come on, Thomas, you're really kind of ruining this. And then he like, he jets. I mean, if you've seen Hamilton, goes off to France um, and hangs out there. Um, and there's so much more to that story and the French Revolution all happens and eventually comes back to just watch Hamilton. But part of the American story then is that later on, um, we have this idea of the great compromise when we get what we know is today, right? In our House and our Senate and how we have representatives based on population, something called the three-fifths compromise. And we know that the South had more people. But if all those people were counted, basically, if all those people, people who were enslaved were counted, it would mean that the South would be more represented. And the North didn't want that. A lot of times we paint the North and the, the United States as the good guys. But just to be honest, the North were the ones that didn't want to accept the population in the South because it would give the South more power. And so they passed the Three-Fifths Compromise. And the Three-Fifths Compromise, if you don't remember from middle school, um, is just basically this idea that um, every five slaves equaled three humans. So basically the people were three-fifths of a man equation that started being operated. And um, that was a problem in American history. Um, and it's a sad story as we look at this. But people started pushing back. And this is kind of uh, the dark realities of our own story. Now, then things got trickier. Haiti has essentially a slave revolt in 1804. And we'll learn about this as unit. Um, they ended slavery because the slaves, people who were enslaved in Haiti, um, kind of rose up against the French because they were a French colony. Um, fought back and established their own republic. And this is important. They were the first free um, black republic, right? Their legacy was born of the Atlantic slave trade. And so we see this being born. Now, just remember, in the United States, this is freaky. People like Thomas Jefferson are probably like, Ugh. these black people rose up and found freedom. We don't want that here. And that is another dark part of our history. And so when we look at this, the United States will then ban the slave trade in 1808, not slavery. And there's a whole bunch of however's there. However, they increased in the domestic slave trade. People between Virginia, New Orleans, kind of down the river were trading slaves all over the place. They started promoting the idea of breeding slaves. Um, so that they could keep up with Southern demands. And there was another movement that there should be colonization and sending people who were Black back to Africa. Um, but people are like, we our heritage is there, but why would we go and live there? Like our home is in the United States. And so when we start looking at this story, it's so messy. Um, and I, American studies, you'll learn even more about this. Um, 
But I just want to remind you of the power of storytelling to change time. And there were some amazing stories that were written, very similar to a lot of Equiano's story. And we saw how that impacted um, basically Britain and their abolitionist story. We have the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. And we also have the narrative of Sojourner Truth, who uh, is a female, gave the female perspective here. And then I'm not going to lie. I learned this uh, today. Uh, but just this idea of this other really great, like, and again, these books sold and people heard of the horrors of slavery within the United States. People in the North were outraged. And then came a book written by a white woman that um, was also influential. But I just want to check us for a second here. Again, today this hit me. That the story that you maybe heard of, maybe you even read of Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Harriet Beecher Stowe is a white woman who wrote about, again, the horrors of slavery. Um, it had some religious overtones to it and basically what it was like. But when people read this story, it outraged the North so much so that um, it kind of really public opinion shifted. But for me, that hit me in the gut is this idea of we needed a white woman to tell the story of slavery compared to people who lived it firsthand and people didn't listen to that story. That's tragic, okay? I think it's so important for us to listen to the voices of people who've experienced things, even today, right? And there's some power in listening to people's stories and believing the experiences that they have another time, but that's important. Either way, there's a civil war. <laughs> I'm just gonna jump over that. Um, 1865, um, they will abolish slavery in the United States with the passing of the 13th Amendment and the Constitution. 14th and the 15th Amendment also then establish citizenship rights, um, voting rights, etc., for people who were African Americans. And so that's a huge part of the story, but we see this movement of people pushing and the power of story to make a difference. Now, um, this will then extend to the Southern Hemisphere as we look at the Latin American revolutions that will follow in 1810 to 1822 throughout the Latin American world, right? Former Spanish colonies as they abolish slavery in these realms. Um, the last place to actually ban the slave trade will be Brazil. And we've talked about how brutal slavery was in Brazil. Again, a Portuguese colony. Um, and it wasn't until 1888 that they abolished slavery in Brazil. Now, I just want you to kind of check that year for a second because 1888, we are 12 years away from 1900. This makes me sound really old, but I was born in the late 1900s, 1981. But either way, like uh, nearly 100 years before I was born, slavery was still in existence in Brazil. Like that's crazy, right? Um, and so, Things to think about how this process took. Now, this just means slavery's ended. And we know from our own American story that just because slavery's over, like what some people believe, that there's still a lot of problems, that there's a lack of equality. Like there's a reason why people today are still saying Black Lives Matter, because there is still roots that are still around that cause inequities in our own nation today and these other nations as well. So we could stay here in a long time, but this is a huge movement. Now, the other kind of ending movement I want to talk about that starts in this time, starts from the Enlightenment, is the feminist movement. And I know people like when they hear that word, think of a lot of different things. But the feminist movement really is just the fact that women, I don't know, surprise here, women should have equal rights to men. And that's essentially feminism. <laughs> ism, the practice of the rights of women. And so this equal rights and this um, kind of early on 1792, a vindication of the rights of women by Mary Wollstonecraft was written. And it really just promoted this idea that again, ah, crazy that women should have equal rights to men, which at this time was a crazy idea. She really pushed for equal education for women as well. And again, people push back against this. Um, 
So much so um, that we're going to see one of the really prominent events is the Seneca Falls Convention, um, where they got like 300 people together um, and talked about how we could promote equal rights for women. Specifically, they talked about how women should have the ability to vote. And I think that's crazy to think about how late it was that women achieved the ability to vote, even when we're just looking at American elections. It's much later, right? 19th Amendment. Um, and so we're going to see some really key people, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Creesha Mott, who got together at this convention and basically published this work, American Sentiments. And it talked about in there that all men and women are created equal. Um, and they got huge blowback for this. Like they were like in papers, people were poking fun of them. How dare they speak about how women and men should be equal. And sometimes we feel like this is so far removed from our own story. But once again, the idea that while today men and women are equal, we still see those roots and those effects of women not quite having equal access to all things that men do. Another time, another conversation, but that's why people continue to fight for this. Now, I just wanted to know, because we talked about Frederick Douglass before and his slave narratives of the terror and the horror of what that was like. Frederick Douglass was one of the only men at the Seneca Falls Convention. Not only the one of the only men, he was a black man that was fighting for these equal rights. And I think there's a powerful state of um, people who are marginalized fight alongside of other people to get equal rights. It's powerful. And that's what happened at Seneca Falls, as people thought that women should have equal rights, women should be able to vote. As someone who just voted in many elections after I was old enough, like that's a huge deal that I, once upon a time, many of you watching this, babies, uh, at one point weren't allowed to go to school, weren't allowed to vote, that your voice didn't matter as much. And we see these changes come as people tried to expand the enlightenment, not just to white men, not just to white men with property, but all men, all men and women, regardless of race and gender are created equal. Um, I think that's super powerful and that's what we see. And as people extend the women's movement, they really fought in these three areas that women should have equal suffrage rights, meaning they should be able to vote. They should have access to education and they should be able to work um, in careers that they want, right? Um, and not just, you know, nurses and teachers. They could um, become doctors. They could become lawyers, right? They could be politicians, okay? And so these are some of the early movements um, that was inspired by the Enlightenment. And we have so much more that we can do and we can continue to fight for. Um, but I just want to remind you that great storytelling is really a way that you too can be activists and you too can make a difference just like these people did. And I think that their stories are inspiring. So I hope you got some good notes here to understand kind of the, the progression as people fought against the slave trade to end slavery, um, not just the slave trade, and then pushing for equal rights of all people. It's a powerful thing. Um, hope this was helpful. Hopefully in some ways was inspiring as well. Um, we will see you soon. And thanks again for watching.